Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Dr. Ne- I'm, I'm gonna, it's Dr. Gary Aguilar. I'm, I'm saying that properly, right? No, that's fine. Uh-huh. Okay. It's actually, if you spoke Spanish, it's Aguilar, but you know, uh, I don't pronounce it that way. I say Aguilar, so that's fine. <laughs> well, p- can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Because I already know the topic I want to talk about. You're going to fill in a giant gap of knowledge that I have when it comes to so much about JFK. Well, I, I hope I can fill in uh, a gap of knowledge. It, it sounds like you're fairly, uh, fairly reasonably informed yourself, so I may not be filling many gaps. But uh, you know, I'm um, I'm a practicing ophthalmologist in San Francisco. I'm a, a clinical professor at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, I was generally interested in the Kennedy case uh, as a young man. Um, I was 14 years old when the assassination happened. 15 years old when the assassination happened. And uh, my parents were uh, very uh, hardcore Republicans, did not like Kennedy, even though they were Catholics. Uh, they did not like Kennedy as president. Uh, and, uh, in, and subsequent to the uh, assassination, I didn't pay it that much attention, although in the late 60s, uh, uh, driving around while I was pursuing my uh, high school and, and college and medical school career, I, um, I would occasionally hear radio uh, interviews with various people, including Mark Lane and other people being interviewed on the subject of the assassination uh, and debating uh, people who defended the Warren Commission. And it always struck me that the defenders uh, of the Warren Commission look, did not look very good when, when in debates with, uh, with critics. The critics always seem to have uh, the upper hand in terms of, of the facts and what made sense. Um, I picked up a few books and read them, but I was very busy in, in pursuing my career and didn't pay it that much attention. But I did have a copy of Six Seconds in Dallas. I did have a copy of uh, Accessories After the Fact, which I spent a little bit of time reading. That's Sylvia Maris, uh, a really groundbreaking book. Um, uh, and, and, and it sat in, in the back uh, you know, of my mind, uh, but when the film JFK came out, I took an interest. I said, uh, I said, you know, he makes a pretty compelling case. And so I pulled some of those books off the shelf. Uh, I picked up a few more, uh, read fairly heavily. And not too long after that, the Journal of the American Medical Association came out with a, a series of articles slamming Oliver Stone and defending the Warren Commission. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and I, I was pretty much struck by it. So I wrote a letter to the Journal of the American Medical Association challenging um, uh, things that the autopsy doctors had had uh, said that had been published in the Journal of American Medical Association, and they actually published my letter. Uh, they also published a letter by uh, David Mantic uh, and a few other people. Um, and I challenged some of the nonsense that that had been published in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association. Uh, and I didn't pick my letter for publication. The editors at JAMA did, and in scientific discourse. Uh, when a, an editor thinks that a question is asked uh, that's sensible enough to publish it, uh, the respondents answer. But in this particular case, the autopsy doctors stonewalled every question put by all of us in the Journal of American Medical Association. I said, wait a minute, <laughs> this makes no sense. And it sort of galvanized me because I sort of thought uh, uh, that, you know, this is not the way, you know, scientific discourse should run. And uh, it was long past the assassination, virtually 30 years. Uh, did we need to keep, you know, stonewalling things at this point, 30 years later? Um, so a debate happened in Chicago between the Journal of American Medical Association team uh, and critics, which included Sarah Wecht, uh, uh, David Lifton, uh, Roger Feynman, uh, and a couple of other people. Uh, and uh, I went to Chicago, uh, I'm from Chicago originally, um, and uh, had friends and family there. I went to Chicago for the debate uh, and brought some information to the debate uh, the debate team of the critics debate team, Sarah Weck's team, uh, said, listen, if they argue this particular thing, I've got slides already made up for you. Just show them one by one. Well, uh, amazingly enough, uh, 
Uh, they did have an, a, a doctor, a, a guy named Robert Artwall, talk, uh, who made the very argument that I had prepared slides for. And, you know, God love him, but like a fool, he didn't know me from Adam. Cyril Wecht invited me up to the debate stage to present the, the, the counter argument. And, and I did, it brought the house down. Everybody was laughing. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, afterward I told Cyril, I said, Cyril, you know, God love you for bringing me up here, but he, you didn't know me from Adam. I mean, what if I'd gotten up there and blown up in your face? But we, he then interested me in the subject. I got permission to see the original autopsy photographs, uh, saw them at the national archives on two different occasions, um, began writing about the subject and lecturing about the subject. And it's been a passionate interest of mine, uh, ever since. Uh, besides my uh, my practice, my family, uh, I've devoted way too many hours to the subject, uh, 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 and uh, and it continues to be interesting to see how it is argued. Uh, certainly happy to discuss uh, Dale Meyer's take on the single bullet uh, theory or other issues that you may have, but uh, I'll leave it open to you. Why don't you pursue the areas of interest that you have? Um, I would like to talk about the autopsy, but also there's so many aspects that I could ask you questions on, like um, even with uh you brought up a good thing about the witnesses and about the number of people. I think one of the names I actually wrote down was uh, Richard Russell, for instance, um, wanting to back. It was it him wanting to back down from the commission or just that. That's the first thing I noticed when I watched the JFK revisited and also betrayed. I've seen it like 20, 30 times now. Um, the four hour. Yeah, I've seen that 20 and 30 times. It's just it's fascinating because you're always picking up more and more and more. Like I remember hearing about the Harper fragment. But the thing with JFK is there is so much. It's not just the magic bullet. It's not just the lone gunman. It's not just this. You dig deeper into the histories about the these people and you start realizing that there's something bigger at play now talking to paul um i'm probably going to end up pronouncing his last name wrong but paul blow when i was talking to him he mentioned that there's a lot of chokeholds in the jfk case so you got to be careful and what i looked at was these chokeholds seem kind of like alternative routes like they have 10 racers running one race, but you have one that gets first and the rest you really don't need to care about. And that's kind of with all these things, every single thing you can dive into and spend probably what feels like years to go into, whether it's the, the autopsy, when it comes to the brain issue, why is the photographs of the brain in the archive different from the actual photographs? If you're going by the Zapruder film, half of his head should be blown off, right? Like there's, there's just a lot of stuff where it's like, you could spend years into that, but then what's you lose aspect of the main goal, which is why, you know, and I'm the, you're the best person to ask when it comes to medical evidence, like take me through the autopsy. What's different. Like you've seen the original, the original photographs of the brain, but everyone else sees this full, like they have a sketch of it, which is the full actual brain with and no holes in it. And then I like, it's just weird to me. Yeah. Uh, I think it's worth discussing. Let's let's under. I mean, uh, the way I see it uh, is this: having seen the original autopsy photographs, and of course, having seen photographs of the brain, you know, the official brain at autopsy, uh, and of course, having read all about it. <laughs> uh, let's let's step back from the situation and just give anybody who happens to be watching a sort of an overview. Um, so Kennedy is rushed from uh, Dallas. Uh, he's in a casket. Uh, there are people all around the casket. Uh, David Lipton and some people have argued that the body was intercepted and the wounds were rearranged. Uh, I think that that's extraordinarily narrowly unlikely to have happened uh, for the reason that uh, there were people who said, who credible people who said they were with the casket the whole time and they would, no one would have ever let that casket out of their, uh, uh, out of their control to allow a, a change in the wound. And the, and the other thing, and the principal argument uh, for that is that the Dallas doctors said that the, there was a big defect, skull defect in the right rear portion of his head, um, and no such defect appears in the autopsy photographs, and therefore they reconstructed his head uh, so to hide the defect that the autopsy or that the doctors at Parkland had noticed. Uh, the problem with that scenario is, you know, having been involved in a couple of autopsies during my medical school years at UCLA, uh, you can't put tissue back that isn't there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, you would not have been able to reconstruct a skull in that way. Um, so it's, it's, it, it, that makes no sense. But in any case, they, they rushed the body back uh, uh, to, uh, to Bethesda. And it was uh, Jackie Kennedy who suggested they do it at the Naval Autopsy, because right, at the Naval uh, Hospital, um, because Jack had been uh, uh, in the Navy himself. 
And so they, they took it back there and they gave Jack Kennedy to the two op- autopsy pathologists who were there, James Humes uh, and J. Ford Boswell, neither one of whom were particularly competent at doing a, an autopsy on a gunshot wound. They were not forensic pathologists. Uh, they'd never done gunshot autopsies. Um, and so they called in a forensic pathologist from the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, Pierre Fink. Uh, Pierre Fink got there after they'd removed the brain uh, from uh, uh, Jack Kennedy's skull. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, th- that would have eliminated important telltale uh, evidentiary signs to have removed the, sc- the brain from the skull before a forensic pathologist who has some training and background in what to look for. Uh, bad, bad mistake. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately, even Pierre Fink, the forensic pathologist, wasn't a hands-on kind of pathologist. Uh, for the two previous years prior to, uh, or three previous years prior to uh, Kennedy's autopsy, uh, he was in the role of basically reviewing the work of others in his armchair, you know, the, the written reports of others' autopsies. Uh, and as Milton Halpern, who was perhaps the dean of forensic autopsies, <clears throat> forensic pathology, uh, at Columbia NYU has argued, he says, you know, there's a huge difference between standing on a table and 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 trying to do a hands-on autopsy and reviewing the work of others. Uh, and plus, uh, he he said, you know, he was <clears throat> sort of the bastard army child foisted on a, a Navy reunion. Uh, he was clearly outmanned and out uh, 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 out of his element. Uh, uh, being in a Navy facility uh, as an Army man. <clears throat> and then during the autopsy, <clears throat> uh, they're doing the autopsy, and uh, Pierre Fink testified under oath. He said someone, uh, you know, that Dr. Humes uh, asked out loud to a group of, of spectators in the autopsy, autopsy which included uh, 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 generals and admirals who had filed in to, to watch this autopsy. Uh, he, uh, doc, Dr. Humes, the guy who was ostensibly in charge of the autopsy, calls out and says, who's in charge here? You know, And someone in the room, not a doctor, according to Pierre's Fink's testimony, said, I am. You know, And they were not allowed to dissect the back wound. Uh, they, they asked to see Jack Kennedy's clothing, which would have given very telltale signs about where the bullets had gone through, um, and the permission was denied. Um, uh, and, and we have evidence for that, uh, both from Pierre Fink as well as, as others. So in other words, they weren't really in charge of the autopsy. So how best to make sense of the situation? If you read the original autopsy report, it says three bullets were fired and Kennedy fell forward, face down to the floor of the limousine. Now, the, the part fell forward, placed out of the lim- limousine, was written in hand in the handwritten autopsy report, and then in the final printed report, they said face forward, but not down to the floor of the limousine. In any case, and he they quoted uh, uh, a Washington Post reporter's uh, account saying that a rifle was seen being pulled from a, a window above and behind the president, obviously the, the school book depository. That was all part of the original autopsy report. Now, it's not all that unusual to include circumstances um, uh, pertaining to the the, uh, death of of a gunshot victim in an autopsy report. You might include some kind of background information. Uh, But nevertheless, the the element here is three doctors who really don't have a competency in doing a, a complex autopsy like Kennedy's would have had to have been a complex forensic autopsy were given a body we're told he was shot from above behind um, and here's the body tell us to figure out how that happened and so they went in there knowing ahead of time what was expected of them they were expected to find wounds that were consistent with the facts that he had been shot from above and behind Uh, that clearly biased their work and they were also under military command uh they asked to have a forensic pathologist, perhaps uh, the coroner from Baltimore, or Russell Fisher, or any other forensic, truly cred, uh, credentialed, experienced, practicing forensic pathologist come in. Permission on that was denied, again. So they're in a military autopsy. The military controls the autopsy. They tell them what to find. They tell them ahead of time what happened. And they're essentially told what to find. And so, of course, they did. 
they they came up with conclusions and they came up with findings which supported what they had been told had been true. Kennedy had been shot from above and behind by Lee Harvey Oswald. So that that in a nutshell explains why uh, they came up with the conclusions they came up with. And they've been very uh, uh, stubbornly resistant ever then, ever since then. Um, I had conversations with uh, both Dr. Boswell and Humes on the phone that I recorded, uh, which we can go into at some point, but that has to do with <clears throat> some other issues, uh, uh, specifically what Gerald Posner reported in his book, Case Closed, because uh, both doctors denied what Posner had uh, had attributed to them in his book. Uh, that that having been said, let's let's look at the evidence itself. And the evidence is pretty interesting. Let's talk, for example, about the brain. Okay, the brain is removed before Pierre Fink, the only forensic pathologist, gets there, <clears throat> and uh, it is weighed. Now, one assumes that the pathologists know how to weigh tissue. Okay, the brain and evidence. Uh, uh, according to the supplemental autopsy report, i.e. it wasn't uh, measured the night of the autopsy the brain weight. Uh, it was taken out of the brain. But uh, several days later, and there's tremendous confusion about this because there's re good reason to suppose that different brains were examined uh, on two different occasions. Go ahead. Do you want to ask a question? Sure. Yeah. You, the question I have is that you're talking about the brain. The brain was weighed. It was above average of a normal brain, which wouldn't make sense because if you're talking about a bullet that got hit, hit him in the head, that he would have lost fragments of his brain, not had this fully intact brain like the one that was photographed. Right. I, th I think that this is a fascinating issue uh, to those of us that uh, have studied this subject. Um, an average adult human brain, male human brain, Kennedy's had an average hat size, so he didn't have a particularly large head. People with very large heads may have somewhat high, uh, larger brains uh, to, <laughs> to fit their large skull. Um, uh, I think his hat size was seven and an eighth. Um, uh, and average human brain uh, weighs are, weights are 1,250 to 1,400 grams. Uh, at autopsy, Jack Kennedy's brain was weighed in at 1,500 grams. Now, as you say, you can see Kennedy's brain material being blasted all over Dealey Plaza in Zabruder frame 313. Uh, the cops were uh, uh, riding to JFK's left rear. Uh, Bobby Hargis uh, was splattered with brain. Um, the, there was brain material on the trunk of the car uh, behind uh, uh, Jack Kennedy and to the left side of the trunk. Uh, the the uh, guy riding a limousine behind Jack Kennedy had his arm out, the Secret Service agent had his arm out, and the, and the left side of his uh, jacket was uh, splattered with brain material. So there's brain material being blown all over the place, plus there's particles of brain all over the place, and plus Jackie Kennedy uh, said, uh, according to testimony by the anesthesiologist at Parkland that took care of Kennedy, uh, Pepper Jenkins, uh, uh, that Jackie brought in a large chunk, quote unquote, a large chunk, of Kennedy's brain and handed it to him. So there's a lot of Jack Kennedy's brain that was blown all over the place, which you see in the film, which makes sense, okay? And yet all of a sudden the brain in evidence, um, and there are uh, sketch diagrams of it uh, published by the House Select Committee on Assassinations, uh, which uh, are reasonable uh, depictions of what the actual photograph of the brain looks like that came in an autopsy. Now that brain was not autopsied or examined in detail on the night of the uh, uh, original autopsy on the night of the assassination because brains are so soft and squishy, they have to put them in formalin to firm them up. Um, so a brain then is, is examined, was examined a few days later, and there's a lot of controversy about this because it appears there were two different brains examined, but the brain now in evidence weighs uh, 1,500 grams, which is more than, than an adult human brain. Now, Humes testified that two thirds of the, of, the, of the large lobe of the brain had been blown away. That's the right parietal lobe of the brain. Uh, everyone who was at the autopsy said that large parts of the brain were blown away. Uh, Boswell said a large part of the brain was blown away. Half of the, uh, half of the right cerebrum was blown. In other words, everyone who saw the original brain said that a large part of the brain was blown away. But when you look at the photographs, you see that the right parietal lobe, the larger lobe of the brain on the right side, was displaced outward, uh, but very little of it appears to be missing um, in that brain. It, that makes no sense. Where, where did the brain material go? Now, uh, not too long ago, a, uh, an atmospheric chemist uh, who does a lot of work for the government 
uh, Nicholas Nally uh, published some papers uh, supporting the idea of a jet effect that the expulsion of brain material going out to the right of Jack Kennedy's skull is what drove him back to the left, at least initially. And then that was added, uh, then after that, there was a neuromuscular reaction, which then uh, drove him back further to the left, back into the left. Uh, it made no sense. His supposition, knowing that the brain uh, in evidence weighed uh, 1,500 grams, uh, Nick Nally said, well, <clears throat> given how much material must have been ejected from his skull to drive him back to the left, Kennedy's uh, brain prior to autopsy must have weighed 2,100 grams. I mean, that doesn't even pass the laugh test. Human brains just don't weigh that much. They just I, don't weigh that much. When you say it out loud, it's kind of like, I don't understand what's happening. But then you realize like a lot of the general public doesn't know a lot of this stuff, like the information on this. Has, I didn't know about it until I started researching into it. Like I knew about that if they came in, the, if the bullet, whatever, came into the back of his head, that it exploded this right part of his head and he hit a nerve, which caused his head to jerk back. And I just go, that just doesn't sound right. I mean, saying it out loud, you, you start to laugh a little bit where I go, if it was a shot from the front and then we go by the witness testimony, the 70 something people in the secret service members that talk about there was an explosion from the back and brain flew up every single where, I mean, that's consistent with the fact that later they found the Harper fragment and the Harper fragment fits perfectly with a sketch that I, I forgot who did the sketch that placed it right there in the back of the head. And it's weird because when you look at the autopsy, unless I'm looking like I'm drinking from a well or I'm drinking the Kool-Aid or something, if you look at the autopsy, the right side of his head does not look like how they're depicting the Zapruder film or all these things happen. It just doesn't make sense like that. But what is in the autopsy where you see JFK laying out on that table is the whole back part of his head looks like it's like it there's looks like there's a mess back there like there's an open hole in the back of his head and then it goes into like david lifton talking about best evidence where they lifted the body and they were able to like draw hair in or something like that i don't know all that because i wasn't there i don't understand that experience but it makes it really hard to be able to decipher the information if you're just the general public looking in at this yeah i mean a, a very simple way of looking at it, it, it is to say Kennedy's brain was massively damaged. We know that from all the witness testimony. And yet the brain was not massively damaged. Are we looking at the same brain? Is the same brain, is, is that Jack Kennedy's brain that was uh, examined in that supplemental autopsy? And my supposition is that it was not. So, uh, but to maintain the idea that Oswald did it, uh, you have guys like Nicholas Nally in a, quote, peer-reviewed journal saying that Kennedy's brain prior to autopsy must have weighed 2,100 grams uh, because it was the loss of 600 grams of material ejecting forward to the right that drove him backward. Well, that makes no sense because Kennedy brains, human brains just don't weigh that much, period, <laughs> end, of, end of sentence. Uh, they don't. Um, uh, but then uh, there are other issues that, that come to the fore having to do with the... Uh, uh, with the defect in Jack Kennedy's skull. The original autopsy report reports, the original autopsy report says that Kennedy's skull defect was 13 centimeters in, in anterior posterior direction. In other words, uh, from the top of his head, uh, there was 13 centimeters of brain tissue missing or of skull tissue uh, missing. And, uh, and yet that's not true either. If you look at the autopsy face sheet written by uh, J. Thornton Boswell, uh, there is a notation, and that was written during the autopsy, and it says 17 missing. And he was asked under oath. I asked him myself. Other people have asked him. He said, when we first got the body, we measured the skull defect, and it was 17 centimeters of tissue missing, of skull missing, okay? And when... They got some fragments of bone that that were flown in from Dallas, and they put it back into the into the rear of the skull. Then the skull defect only measured 13 centimeters, and that's what they put in the autopsy report. But the original uh, wound, as described by the autopsy doctors on the night of the autopsy, when they had the body right in front of them, was 17 centimeters. And I asked people, okay, get yourself a caliper, put it on a, uh, the human head of an average human like me, and I've done this. And let's assume that the defect goes just to the hairline because we know that there's no, obviously his forehead isn't missing, okay? So we know that the defect goes right to about to Jack Kennedy's hairline um, uh, and you take the caliper back, 
that defect would have gone all the way well back into occipital bone, way back into the bone where they sit, where the official version has it and the House Select Committee versions has it. There was no defect back there, but there had to have been just by the simple mathematics of the measurement of the skull defect as noted on the night of the autopsy. So there was a huge defect on the right side of the skull. And then there's this business about jet effect. Well, the, the jet effect won't work for multiple reasons. We can go into those if you'd like yeah. some real detail on that. But the jet effect won't work for multiple, multiple reasons um, uh, because the, the jet effect, any jet effect that would have uh, caused would have had minimal effect because it was also, if he was shot from behind, uh, the impact of the bullet on the back of the skull would have driven the skull forward. Well, how do we know that? Well, the, you'll see there was um, a video produced with Gary Mack of the Sixth Floor Museum um, and you can find it on uh, Vimeo or online someplace uh, inside the target car where they duplicated, uh, tried to duplicate the shot uh, from above and behind using Manicar Arcanos on a skull, uh, on, on a, a test skull where they tried to match the hardness of a skull and the contents of the brain tissue and all that sort of stuff. And they shot that in this duplication test from above and behind. And sure enough, they showed a defect on the right side of the skull. But you watch the video, the skull doesn't go back. OK, the, the U.S. government uh, at Aberdeen Proving Grounds at, for the biophysics lab at Aberdeen Proving Grounds in 1964 did skull shooting experiments and they filled skull, human skulls uh, with uh, brain equivalent material, shot them from above and behind. All of them went away from the rifle. None of them recalled back from the rifle. And they were shattered, so then, too, right? They were shattered. Oh, yeah. There was, and, and more more interestingly enough, I've written about this and you can see the images from the original uh, high speed uh, uh, films that were shot at, I think, 2200 uh, frames a second, you know, so you could really see what's happening. Um, the original egress of material when they shot them from behind, the original egress of material is from the entrance. In other words, you start seeing a puff of stuff coming out of the back of the skull before it explodes to the front and then both the front and back explode with about as much material exploding backward as explodes forward. That's what happens when you actually shoot human skull. Now, unfortunately, they're not an exact duplication because these are not living skulls. These are desiccated, dried uh, skulls, um, but they're filled with brain, uh, filled with brain equivalent material. Um, uh, but there's been a huge uh, 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 pressure to try to, to convince people that um, that the skull shooting experiments, you know, that, that you shot from behind and that there was a jet effect that removed backward. And perhaps the most notorious uh, defender of this is a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Louis Alvarez uh, uh, of Berkeley. And um, in the American Journal of Physics in September of 1976, uh, American Journal of Physics, he wrote an uh, uh, article uh, reporting on his skull shooting experiments where he shot melons. And he said that melons were the best mock-up of a human head. And when he shot the, the, the melons, uh, sure enough, the melons recoiled back toward the shooter. And he said, you know, um, you know, therefore, I think that, you know, Kennedy was shot from above and behind. We've demonstrated this uh, with these melon shooting experiments using something what's the best mock-up of a human head. But he didn't tell us a lot of stuff, okay? First of all, he didn't shoot manic or carcano bullets. According to John Latimer, who also defends the Warren Commission, he supercharged the bullets for, and did not use jacketed bullets. He used soft nose bullets and he, at, that shot that fired not at the Manicar Cano speed, about 2,000 feet per second or 2,100 feet per second. He, he used bullets that shot at, that fired at 2,800 feet per second. And he wasn't even happy with those. So he, he hot loaded those so they'd, they'd travel at 3,000 feet per second. And so shooting bullets that at, at, at melons, which are totally unlike human skulls, a melon has a soft exterior, a bullet would cut through it like a knife through butter. Um, he got jet effect by shooting the wrong kind of bullets at the wrong kind of targets, uh, melons weighing half of what a human head weighs, and, and that he never told us any of that in his reporting. Alvarez kept that information from the public and, 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 didn't, and he kept something else that was much more important. And that is that he said, if we had shot at lots of different targets and only reported those that gave us, uh, you know, recoil back toward the shooter, well, we could be criticized. About five or six years ago, seven years ago, um, 
Josiah Thompson, the author of Six Seconds in Dallas, who has come out with a book called Last Second in Dallas, <clears throat> asked for uh, ask a good friend of his, Paul Hoke, um, uh, for uh, any information about this. And Hoke had photographs of the original shooting experience because Paul Hoke had been a graduate student in physics, got a PhD in physics at Berkeley, and had studied under Alvarez and had been involved in those sh uh, uh, shooting tests. It turns out that from Paul Hoke's file of, of what they had done, they shot at lots of things. They shot at lots of things. Everything went away from the rifle except the melons, okay? And yet Alvarez said, if we had shot a lot of different things and only reported those that went back, by we, we could be criticized. Well, yes, let us criticize it. And let's also criticize the fact that, that, uh, that for many years early in the case, back in the early 1990s, um, Paul Hoke was very defensive of uh, Luis Alvarez. And, um, uh, and, and yet his reporting was entirely dishonest. Um, and, uh, and he continues to be defended by other people like Nicholas Nally. In any case, uh, other shooting, uh, skull shooting tests were done that allegedly showed recoil. Son reported by um, uh, John uh, Latimer uh, originally in, in, in some, I, I think it was not exactly a peer reviewed paper, although it may have been, but he's also put it in his book, Kennedy and Lincoln. And he shot down at skulls that were perched atop ladders. And sure enough, he shot them with Malachar or counter rifle, and those skulls came backward off the ladder. But the, the problem was, if, if you see the videos, uh, the, the, the skulls are sitting flat on top of a ladder with his chin, the bony chin lay flat on top of the ladder. They hit this, this and he shoots them from above downward. And when they hit, the skull recoils backward, but the ladder moves forward. And as Don Thomas and other people have pointed out, what happens there is that the bullet strikes the skull, the forward momentum is driven to the ladder, which moves forward, and the skull bounces backward off it. In other words, there is no legitimate, there has been no legitimate tests that actually show recoil of bullets uh, hitting skulls like this. And yet this is still the standard uh, acceptance. And then of course, there's the other reaction, other explanation, as you mentioned, uh, uh, nerve muscle hitting, that sort of stuff, uh, neuromuscular reaction. Anyone who is interested in this can, can see what I've written on the subject because there are three basic types of neuromuscular reactions. And here's the, here's the concept as explained, as explained before the House Select Committee on Assassination by a guy named Larry Sturdivant, <clears throat> that when the head exploded, there was a discharge of uh, neurological impulses down the spinal canal and all the muscles were contracted, okay? Those uh, that, that drive the flexor muscles and those that drive extensor muscles, uh, you know, like the back. And it turns out that the extensor muscles, the ones that drive in the back are more powerful than the flexor muscles. And so that predominated and it was that neuromuscular reaction. He's hitting the head, all the nerves fire and the head moves back into the left because of a neuromuscular reaction. Well, the three types of neuromuscular reaction are decorticant, decerebrate and neurospastic. We'll just call it that way. And just without getting too much into the weeds on this, None of those fly for the reason that a decorticate reaction, your hands move in toward your chest like this and your legs extend and your, and your back moves backward. Not necessarily your head, but your back moves backward. That's not what we see in the, in the Zabruder film. What we see is the head moving backward and the back following it. His head still flex inward. Okay, how about de decerebrate? Well, in decerebrate, and by the way, as, as I did, I was a trauma surgeon for a while at UCLA at Harvard General Hospital, and I've seen decerebrate reactions. First of all, they don't occur instantaneously, and that's something the House Select Committee uh, mentioned. They, it, it takes more than a second or two for decerebrate and decorticate reactions to take place, and these happen instantaneously. But a decerebrate re decorticate, your hands move in, your legs extend, and your back moves back and your head follows. In, in decerebrate, your arms move out, your back moves back, and your heads extend. Well, you don't see Jack Kennedy's legs extending. You don't see his body jolting upward. You see his head moving back, and his back follows passively, and his arms fold down to his side. They don't extend outward in decerebrate. They don't cross his chest and decorded it. Well, there's a last one that was talked about, and again, I've written about this, you know, a neurospastic, let's call it. And they did some goat shooting experiments and shot goats who were restrained with 30-30 uh, bullets. And you can see the images there in Larry Sturdivant's book. I've shown copies of them myself. And you see that the, the goat is hit in the head right here. And what you see is the upper arms go out 
and the back or the upper legs go out, the back legs go out, and he flays outward like this, the, the goat butt. But that's not what happens to Kennedy. His arms don't go out, his back legs don't extend, and his and and, and his back does not arch. So none of these work, but they're they're invoked to try to defend the idea that Oswald did it. The neuromuscular reaction is what explains him going back, compounded or in addition to the jet effect, none of which works. But it is the, the very thin reed that they try to stand on, Warren Commission uh, loyalists try to stand on. And, um, and, and it utterly, uh, those explications utterly fail. None of them will work. Um, and yet they're touted by Warren Commission defenders. Um, well, is it a publicity? Case. Is it a publicity aspect? Because you mentioned something in the film that I, I actually thought was quite interesting. It's kind of something that you would really see today with like media, for instance. A lot of the media did not go against the official Warren report, and they even said that. I think Ro is it Robert Feynman was one of the people from like NBC or something that testified saying that there was this report saying they weren't going to go against the official commission statement about what happened with JFK. But it seems like any person that I've talked to who agrees with the magic bullet or agrees with a lone gunman they've won a book prize or they've gotten television time or they've gotten something where i'm like if they agree with the narrative the official thing and then all other stuff gets chalked into conspiracy when i mean just from an average person here i say bullet from the front i mean if there were multiple shooters yeah let's say that i don't know maybe there there's definitely shots from the back if you have a bullet hole in the back or something wherever they they pointed at but i look at like the way that the head gets hit i have that's coming from a front angle that the direction of the way it goes is like if you throw a baseball at my head depending on where you threw it my head's either going to go forward if it's hit from the back or if it's going to go backwards if it's hit from the front and I'm just going off that basis, but there's a lot of stuff where I'm like, either you can call it a shoddy like job or a shoddy autopsy or whatever you want to say with all the ways you can see how they have flaws and all these things. And I go, it's either they didn't know or they were trying to fit this original story. So when you when you interviewed people, not only did you smell any sulfur, but at any point, did you feel like they were blending some facts in from, from it? Because when I was watching JFK Revisited and then watching JFK Betrayed, when they interviewed the one guy who was in charge of the Warm Commission, I can't remember if it's – it's not it's not Helms. Um, oh, God, I'm going to blank on his name. He was in an interview, and they go, have you ever had did any violent acts in your life? And he's smoking a pipe, takes a couple puffs, waits to answer, and goes, no. And then the guy kind of looked at him like, really? Come on. And it's like – that's kind of what I see with a lot of this. There's a lot of cover-up stuff. You mean Alan Dulles. Dulles? Yeah, Alan, you mean Dulles. Alan Dulles. Well, he was right. fired from by JFK, and then he was the one that was investigating, uh, was a charge in charge of the Warren Commission, where it's like a fox investigating the chicken coop. Like you have this aspect of like, I don't want to say like it's all this dirty manipulation of government stuff because people go, that's conspiracy. I go, well, let's try and take politics out of it. And then people go, that's impossible with this. And I go, well, you use terms like right wing, left wing, all this type of stuff. Let's just talk about extremists, which I know from Watergate. During, if you look in Watergate, I read, talked to people who were friends with William Colby, John Ranley being one of them, and he talked about how good of a person William Colby was. Now, necessarily, if you're the bully on the block, do you necessarily know if you're the bully on the block? Like, you eventually start doing a bunch of actions where you really don't realize that you're actually not the hero. You're actually the enemy. And that's kind of what, how the CIA and all these intelligence operations that seem to have encroached way past their original duties. And these people that are involved in there have been getting their way for the longest time. And they expect things to go their way every single time. So when the Kennedy assassination to me is a clear example of the what we call a shoddy job, but really it was evidence of showing that's happening today and they've gotten better at it. They've gotten way better at it. And I think that moment was the first time they slipped up and they really didn't cover all their P's and Q's. It was probably happening way before that as well too. But that, that day, that, that November, that was a serious like Mark, where you can predict everything from Operation Midnight Climax to all these government ops that come out now, where you see it, you see notes of it. Even when I was looking through the JFK and researching on my own, I ended up, the algorithm switched me into RFK. 
And I ended up looking into RFK and I'm like, it's like, it's like smelling a wine glass. Like I'm picking up notes of JFK. It's the same method. They have similar notes to it, but it's, it's still going on. And I'm not saying it's like they're, they're doing it like that. Now they probably have a different form of it, but it's a method where they got away with that. And the commission report, the people that want to believe in it, despite all the evidence that comes out that says there's all these phone calls and all these things where even people on the Warren Commission report, my own research, I go, there's a lot of people that were stepping down from being in the Warren Commission. And I go, how much were they getting paid? Like you think that would even money aside, you're finding out who killed the president. Like that's a, something you would put on your resume, but you had a bunch of people that were turning down from it where I go, that's a sign of someone that doesn't want to go against their integrity. So I go, that is some, that's a, that's a, that's a red flag for me. That's something where I'm like, somebody needs to look into that and make sure it's going effectively. And there's a lot of people that talked about it privately saying that the Warren commission didn't really do their job in a sense. Now I want to push all the blame on the Warren commission, but if you're trying to fit a narrative, that magic bullet fits, we're going to make it fit. And I think I, I, I could be wrong. I don't know. Well, let's, we, we can talk about the magic bullet. I want to uh, touch on two things. One is the media, uh, and much has been written about this. I would recommend um, a, an essay, which anybody can Google up and find, uh, written uh, by Jerry Polikoff, uh, and I'll try to think of the name of the other, uh, how the media assassinated the JFK story. Uh, uh, in any case, uh, they go through it line by line by line. But I would just point to one thing, and that is, uh, I should have brought it up here to read the exact quote uh, from the New York Times edition of the Warren Report, which was released simultaneously with the government's uh, issuance of the Warren Report in October 1964. Uh, the Warren Report comes out about a month later, all the volumes, supporting volumes come out. And in and the New York Times produced a hardback edition as well as softback editions of the Warren Report, <clears throat> as the government also produced its own edition of the Warren Report. In the New York Times edition of the Warren Report, you have introductory essays. And in, uh, in one of them, Anthony Lewis, the noted New York Times correspondent, it said, and I, this is going to be a close paraphrase, and for anybody that's interested, I'd be happy to give them the page number or make a copy of the page in which he says this. He says, the Warren Commission released all the evidence that it had gathered, whether agreeing with its conclusions or not, and withheld only the names of a few personnel in, uh, uh, in American embassies in places like Mexico City for national security reasons. Otherwise, it released everything, all the information it had, whether agreeing with its conclusions or not. So flash forward to the, to the establishment of the Assassination Records Review Board in the early, early mid-1990s. They then start de looking through uh, declassified documents. And during that whole period from 1964 to the early 1990s, Warren Commission documents had been re being released year after year after year that had not been released according, you know, uh, uh, but when the, the, uh, uh, the Assassination Records Review Board got there, there were still 3,000 pages of documents that the Warren Commission uh, had suppressed uh, that were still being held secret. So, but you had Anthony Lewis telling the public, don't worry, all the evidence is out there, you can trust us. And that's what the well, that's what American journalists do, and and it's it's not at all uh, unusual. I mean, if if you look at the early reporting in the in the liberal anti-war pro-democrat uh, New York Times uh, after our coup in Iran in '53, in Guatemala in '54, in Chile in '73, in Indonesia in '64, '65, you'll find reports in the early uh, aftermath of those coups. Uh, uh, some reports saying, well, reports the United States had something to do with it. these coups is completely misguided, unsubstantiated, anti-American propaganda, probably communist disinformation. Well, of course, the documents come out 20, 30, 40 years later, and we find out the United States had everything to do with that. In the run-up to the Iraq War, um, day after day after day, stories by Michael Gordon and Judy Miller, a front page of the New York Times, Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, we need to go to war, you know, he's an imminent threat, on and on and on. Ultimately, that's completely debunked. But the New York Times basically was cheerleading for war there. So the New York Times is, establishes the limits uh, of, of respectable journalism. And it always stands with the government, uh, particularly in issues that are of tremendous moment, such as uh, the Vietnam War, happily reporting that we were attacked at the Gulf of Tonkin, which we were not, happily reporting that we were facing an imminent threat from Saddam Hussein, which we were not. 
happily reporting we were not involved in the coups that we were very intimately involved with, and many of the on the ground journalists knew that. So to see them standing by the Warren Commission uh, is, is no surprise. Uh, uh, Jefferson Morley, uh, Norman Mailer, David Talbot, and Anthony Summers uh, published a letter, surprisingly, in the New York Times, uh, criticizing a very negative review uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, Oliver Stone, um, and basically gave a list of people who suspected and believed there had been a conspiracy, which included uh, LBJ, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, and a whole host of people who were quite respectable who, who believed that. But you will not read that in the New York Times, except maybe in a letter to the editor, and I can get that for you. But th so, so to expect the media in this country, which I think is corporate controlled, uh, I would recommend people uh, pick up a book called Into the Buzzsaw, uh, a group of essays written by journalists, uh, credible, you know, award-winning journalists about how their stories that challenged official narratives on a whole host of issues, from the crack cocaine story to the wars, uh, on and on and on, how their careers were essentially destroyed for basically having challenged uh, the dominant narrative, you know, supported by the government and backed up by the, uh, the New York Times. So to, to, you know, to the fact that New York Times continues to hew the Warren Commission line is, is scarcely surprised. They've, they've hewed the Warren Commission line uh, right uh, from the outset. And in another introductory essay in that October 1964 New York Times edition of the Warren Report, Harrison Salisbury says, no question, and this is again a reasonable paraphrase, not quite as close as my own one on Anthony Lewis, he says, no important question remains unresolved uh, as to what as to what happened in uh, Dealey Plaza on November 22nd, 1963. Well, a whole bunch of things were unresolved, but he's there to reassure you that don't worry, we've gotten to the bottom of it. And it's published before any of the volumes uh, of supporting evidence are released to the public. And they're opining on volumes of material that they couldn't possibly have reviewed when they were reassuring the public, you can trust the government. Um, so that's it. But I do want to touch on the other issue that you raised, and that is that what you see in the Zabruder film, Kennedy goes driven back into the left. Your gut tells you he was shot from the right front. OK, your gut tells you that. Oh, God, obviously a bullet hit him to the right front. Well, I, I've written a lot about this, but let's talk about some physical evidence that I think is pretty darn important. And that is that the X-rays the original x-rays, unenhanced x-rays that you that I've seen in the National Archives, uh, as interpreted not only by me, but by uh, Russell Morgan, who was the chairman of the Department of Radiology and uh, and described those x-rays in the, in the Clark panel report in 1967, as well as other people who have seen them. What you see in the x-rays is a cloud of tiny little fragments in the right front quadrant of his head. That was Dr. Morgan's description that they were in the right front part of the head. I agree with that, but people would, you know, Warren Commission loyalists and defenders would say, oh, we can't trust you because you're a critic. <laughs> okay, why don't you take it from somebody who's a defender, Russell Morgan, these tiny fragments in the right front part of the head. Well, jacketed bullets don't give tiny little minuscule dust-like fragments. The dust-like fragments were, were described, uh, although he didn't have the x-rays on hand to, to, uh, during his testimony, by Dr. Humes, uh, in testimony for the Warren Commission. They were also described by an FBI agent, or sorry, by a Secret Service, Service agent who was there at the autopsy, saying there were a bunch of tiny dust-like little fragments, uh, Russell Morgan, and, and, and others have, have seen them. Well, jacketed bullets break upon entering a skull and leave a trail of smallish fragments, but not tiny ones. And is there exper experimental support for that? Yes, indeed, there is. Uh, the shooting experiments I talked about before at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds by the Biophysics Lab at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds shot human skulls. And as I pointed out earlier, all the skulls went away from the shooter. None of them went back toward the shooter, even though they were filled with brain equivalent material and were said to duplicate Jack Kennedy's shooting circumstances. Shot from behind, you know, hit where Kennedy was uh, alleged to have been hit. All of them were driven away from the, the shooter. Um, and you can see the images uh, you want. They x-rayed one of those skulls, or at least I know that there's one x-ray because it's in the public domain now, um, of one of those test skulls. And you see what happens when a, when a massive arcano bullet hits a skull, what happened to what you see on the x-ray. And you see small, but not tiny, minuscule fragments. 
Minuscule fragments are characteristic not of jacketed bullets, but of non-jacketed bullets. They're characteristic of non-jacketed hunting rounds and a, a, a credible authority, a guy named Masad Ayoub, A-Y-O-O-B, uh, who's a real guns and ammo guy, says that what you see on the Zabruder film is very typical or exactly what you'd expect from a non-jacketed bullet fired from a, uh, from above and behind, uh, above and in front of Kennedy, striking him in the right front quadrant of his head. Uh, and, and that best explains those x-rays. There is no other explanation for why those x-rays show the minuscule fragments, except the fact that he was hit, as you suggest, as your gut tells you when you see this Bruder film, from, a, from above and in front of him with a non-jacketed high velocity hunting round, because those high velocity non-jacketed hunting rounds flatten on impact. Now, when a human skull is hit with a jacketed bullet, a certain amount of forward momentum is driven into the skulls, as we saw in the in Aberdeen Proving Grounds. But when a non, but but it, it passes through and the uh, jacket breaks up inside the skull. A non-jacketed hunting round flattens on impact and applies much more momentum to the skull, because it is not it doesn't drive immediately through. It flattens on impact, releasing a tiny you know, a uh, cloud of minuscule fragments, as we see in Jack Kennedy's x-ray. And that momentum is clearly enough, as has been written by Don Thomas and others, to drive the Kennedy skull back into the left. And that's exactly what you see. You don't see the neuromuscular reaction. His back doesn't arch. His arms don't cross his chest as they would in decorticate reaction if it were neuromuscular, or decerebrate if it were another type of neuromuscular reaction, or uh, uh, neurospastic, as you see with the ghost shooting experiments with the arms go, that doesn't happen. What you see is Kennedy, his head moves back quite rapidly and, um, and his body follows. Um, so the x-ray supported, and of course the witnesses, as you pointed out earlier, all supported, uh, uh, or not all of them, but you know there were quite a number of witnesses, including 21 cops, according to Jeff Mor Morley's calculations, said that a shot came from the right front, uh, or at least came from the grassy knoll area. So there's multiple independent corroborating lines of evidence that support that smoke being smelled by a number of witnesses or is being seen and smelled by a, a number of witnesses in Dealey Plaza, uh, witnesses uh, knowing that that there were or having uh, heard a shot from the grassy knoll, the x-ray supported, uh, Kennedy's movement supports it. All this fits a very nice tight pattern. Um, the official version does not. Uh, in any case, that's uh, uh, that that I think answers your question. And then of course, um, two thirds of his right cerebrum blown away is quite understandable if that had hit it. Now, another thing to talk that's, I think, worth developing here is the business of uh, the idea of jet effect, okay? Um, if there were truly a jet effect, um, the major egress of material would have been to the right front, okay? And yet the cops writing on JFK's right side were not splattered with debris. What you see in the Zabruder film is that, it, it, is that uh, as much material appears to be going upward, which would not give propulsion to move the head uh, to the back as anywhere uh, toward his front. And the people uh, uh, on the left side of the limousine, in the left trunk of the limousine, and the cops are on the left side are splattered with material. And the Harker fragment was found to the left of the, uh, uh, of the limousine as well. So all the, the evidence suggests what you see now. Uh, but you see this huge explosion here, and if he's hit from the right front, why is there a big explosion here? All you need to do is ask guys like Larry Sturdivant, ask um, uh, other people who have seen, or and Masad Ayub, and other people who have lots of experience with guns and ammo, and even look at the original government-done shooting experiments, the biophysics lab. When the skull is hit from behind, the first egress of material is from behind. And, and an explosion like that would have occurred because you're hitting a closed vessel and it explodes, uh, the Kronlein shush effect, or schmush effect, um, is called, and you get you get a huge explosion of material from a bullet shot from, uh, from the front in the area of the head, exploding it as you see it. it it's a perfect fit. Uh, in any case, those are those are two issues that you raised that, uh, I, that I I thought would be worth it. So if if it were truly a jet effect, <clears throat> the fact that forcible egress of material goes to the left and goes above, hardly gives you enough force ejecting from the right to e explain the jet effect back into the left. 
So I'm not yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I'm not crazy in saying all that, right? Like, I, I, no, I, I, I think okay. I think you're, you're you're right. But but again, there's X-ray evidence support for a shot from the right front. There's lots of witness support from the right front. Uh, there's debris field evidence for a shot from the right front because the debris ends up going to the left uh, more so than the right. Uh, what more do you need? I truly got really invested into this when I found out about the number of witnesses that were afraid to speak out because the number of witnesses that died under mysterious circumstances. Now, there are some where I'm like, there's OK, this death maybe makes sense. I don't know. But there was a couple of them where like you're hearing accounts. And I don't know if it goes into conspiracy of people calling other people saying that somebody's following me or there's these types of things. But there's a lot of witnesses or people that were there at that plaza that day that have died under mysterious circumstances where I start going, I mean, were they shutting people up? I don't know. Were they saying that they were going to talk? That's all up in the air for skepticism. But it also skews the amount of interviews that you get to see now. Even when I see some people like in Oliver's film that they had clips of speaking, they even talked about like, yeah, this person didn't really go into details, avoided a question or something like that on Walter Cronkite's show. And I go, I get you're not going to get a lot from the people that are still involved in it or they have their government salary. It's much like the guy who took photos of the brain. His name's Stephen, forgetting his last name. He worked for the Navy for a very long time. You got to help me out. John Stringer. John Stringer. Is it John Stringer? Well, he's the autopsy. He was the autopsy photographer. And his wife said, well, he was a Navy guy. Like he wasn't going to go against, you know, he's going to keep his mouth. So the reason why he had secret top clearance. And it goes, that's, you'll find that a lot with a lot of these people that are involved in there. Probably there was a lot of people that wanted to speak out, but they knew they'd lose their job. And the people that did, they were like, save my testimony until after I'm dead. Like they, they, it's kind of like an academic. They're not going to go against their institution unless they got tenure where they're like untouchable. Like, and it, it makes it difficult because when you're interviewing people or if you're trying to get the story of it, like the AARB, if, if they try to get a story or talk to some witnesses, how many people just deny doing it in fear of, I don't want to raise my voice and end up like the other people that raise their voice on it? Well, you know, there, there's I mean, one needs to remember that in that era, um, uh, and I've written about this as well, um, uh, even the Warren commissioners said, you know, well, you know, what could you do about J. Edgar Hoover in those days? And, and J. Edgar Hoover was notoriously corrupt. Uh, men spent, I think, 25 to 30 years in jail for murders they did not commit in Boston while the FBI was protecting the known murderers who they knew to have been murderers. I mean, this, this is well described in numerous sources. Uh, the FBI was notoriously corrupt. And, and you can even take it from uh, FBI agents themselves. Um, in James Hostie's book, uh, I forget the name of the book, but James Hostie was the guy that uh, got a note from Oswald that was uh, was destroyed by the FBI, presumably on the orders from Hoover. You can bet that the agent in charge of the Dallas office, the Dallas FBI office, Gordon Shanklin, ordered James Hostie to rip up and throw that note away that he had gotten from, from Oswald. There's speculation about what was in the note, uh, but what's clear is that uh, that uh, they were destroying evidence right there from the outset. And and in in Hostie's book, uh, he writes that he got you know unauthorized access to his own files uh, regarding what he had said and done during uh, the Kennedy in, uh, investigation after the assassination. And he said that, and this is an FBI agent saying that they had falsified the internal record of what he had reported. Now, you know, and then you have an FBI agent named Bardwell Odom. Bardwell Odom is supposed to have gone back around to Parkland Hospital and interviewed the guys that found the so-called magic bullet, which we can discuss. And um, and in the uh, Warren Commission uh, uh, exhibit 2011, it reports that Bardwell Odom interviewed the two guys that found that bullet on a stretcher in Dallas, and that both guys said, yeah, it looks like the bullet we saw that day. Um, well, it turns out that there is no report of, from Bardwell Odom to the FBI saying that in the original documents, and we've had the uh, FBI as well as the National Archives look for any such reports, and you can bet if he had done that, there would be a report. And then more importantly, uh, I called Bardwell Odom, uh, Tink Thompson, and I went to his home and interviewed him in his home. And Bardwell Odom said, I never had that bullet. I never showed it to these guys. It didn't happen. 
And of course, there's no FBI backing up that it that uh, you know, and no internal documents supporting that Bardwell Odom had done it. Uh, and uh, Bardwell Odom specifically not. Well, you had the FBI in a letterhead memorandum written July 7th, 1964, Commission Exhibit 2011, the Warren Commission Exhibit 2011, I think in volume 25 or something like that, a Warren Commission uh, exhibits, um, saying, I never did it, uh, saying that he, that, that, that these guys, you know, said the bullet resembled the, the, the so-called magic bullet that's now in evidence resembled the bullet they had that day. Uh, so the, the FBI has, you know, these are what Don Thomas has referred to as socially constructive um, uh, phenomenon. In other words, it is socially constructive for the people to trust their government would do honest work. Okay, so if you have to lie to convince the public that the government has done honest work, why? Well, that's what you do because it's socially constructive. And, um, uh, and, and social constructivism, I think, affects a lot of people. Let's take uh, Michael Bodden. Uh, Michael Bodden was the chairman of the Forensics Pathology Panel for the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Uh, an eminently qualified forensic pathologist uh, was the guy who basically backed up the Warren Commission's conclusion that Ken the Kennedy was shot uh, by uh, Oswald uh, based on their review of the forensics evidence, which again is worth our discussing somewhat, particularly given the, the autopsy photographs, but we can touch on that in a minute. In any case, uh, in his book, um, uh, I'll try to think of the name of it. Um, uh, uh, in, in a book he's written and in lectures he's given, which you can find on a Google search right now. I mean, I think they're still up there. I've seen them in the last four or five years. Um, and in a debate that I had with him in 2013, I think it was, um, Baden says, well, you know, the autopsy photographs aren't very good uh, because the autopsy pathologist who took them, um, uh, you know, was taken off the job and the autopsy photographs were taken by the FBI, the Secret Service agents, okay? Complete and utter nonsense. And, and the way we know that's nonsense is because the forensic pathology panel, the one that he chaired his own report says the guy that took the autopsy photographs was John Stringer. And John Stringer was not a Navy man. He was a civilian working for the Navy. And he wasn't an unqualified autopsy photographer. Uh, he was such a good autopsy photographer that the Navy and other branches of the military would send people to, to work with John Stringer to learn how to do autopsy photography. But John Stringer himself uh, testified that autopsy photographs he took are missing. And so did everyone else who was involved in the autopsy photographs, including all three of the pathologists. Um, uh, a woman named Sandra Spencer said that she saw autopsy, she developed autopsy photographs uh, at uh, a film developing center after the autopsy that, that are not there. John Stringer said that autopsy photographs that are, photographs that are taken are missing. And you can go right down the list of people. And, and one of the things that is most obvious to anyone that even has a lick of common sense is that in the extant file of autopsy photographs that are available on the web and the, and, and the bootleg copies, which I've seen myself, as well as the originals, you see a, cop, a, a photograph of Kennedy being shot from the left side where he does not have an injury, okay? And he's lying on the gurney table being shot from the left side where he's not injured, okay? There's no similar photograph from the right side where he is injured. You think they didn't take a photograph like that? Of course they did. Stringer says that uh, he was told that some of the, he was using these, these duplex um, uh, uh, film things where you, you take a picture, you flip it over, and you take another picture of duplex uh, film holders. And he was told that a bunch of the film holders uh, that he submitted were empty. And he says, that's complete and utter rubbish. You know, a not size photographer of his caliber would not have shot empty uh, 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 film holders. Um, and yet, oh, get, hey, guess what? Well, the reason why all the autopsy photographs aren't here is because of the, because uh, you mistakenly took photographs uh, in empty film holders. You know, complete and utter rubbish. This, but this is how you do it. And there's no good view that shows Kennedy's skull wound in a way where you can determine without dispute the front of the head, the back of the head, and the full extent of the defect, which, as I said, according to the original notes taken during the autopsy, uh, measured 17 centimeters. There's, and there's just complete, you know, manipulation of the evidence. I think Jacob Hornberger and other people have talked about uh, uh, some of this stuff. Um, uh, but that's, that's, that's how you, you, you produce the evidence that you want the public to see. You have the New York Times out there telling you, oh, don't worry. Uh, they released all the evidence, you know, whether to agree there or convict, uh, were there uh, Warren Commission's conclusions or not. Uh, you have uh, Harrison Salisbury, the managing editor of the New York Times, saying, don't worry, there's no, no key question remains unsolved. 
uh, pertaining to the events uh, of uh, November 22nd, and he writes that uh, uh, before any of the volumes come out uh, of the Warren Commission. Uh, and, and, and that's how you, you, you try to manufacture consent, to use Noam uh, Chomsky's uh, articulation, uh, that you manufacture consent uh, that the government can be trusted, that the government did not was not covering up any kind uh, of a conspiracy, that he was killed the way the government says he was by a lone nut gunman. <laughs> you know, I, and 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 even without the revelations of all the coups that we were involved in that were originally reported as are not having been involved with by our respected mainstream media, uh, in, in you know, besides what we've learned in Watergate, despise what we learned in the Pentagon Papers. Uh, about all the lies we were told, dutifully reported, as, you know, as truthful by our mainstream media uh, in, in during the Vietnam era. Besides all the lies that have come out in the Afghanistan papers, um, dutifully originally reported by the media as not having been lies, as being factual, uh, were continuously lied to and manipulated uh, to uh, uh, because it's socially constructive. Now, to use John Thomas' term, to have the public trust its government and its respected mainstream journalists. I'm, I know, I'm already scared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to the magic bullet, that, I'm, that's not possible. A bullet entering, doing, making eight holes in, in two people. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, first of all, one of the things that Sarah Wecht has pointed out um, uh, and that, and he's, you know, a, a people perhaps don't consider him much of an expert in forensic pathology. He's only done forty or fifty thousand autopsies. He's probably done more autopsies than any uh, 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 forensic pathologist uh, in history anywhere in the world. Uh, he he is the dean of forensic pathology. Okay, and one of the things he points about uh, out about the the magic bullet is that there are no fabric striations on a bullet. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, a bullet, a tracking bullet. It passes through fabric, the fabric threads of a, a coat or, or a shirt, or whatever, will leave tiny little fine striations. There are none on the magic bullet, okay? Um, and on the so-called magic bullet. Uh, and the magic bullet shows up uh, uh, found on a stretcher, <clears throat> and yet it was not found on the stretcher that Connolly ever laid on. And amazingly enough, I'll be happy to send you the link uh, after we get off here and you can share it with uh, uh, anyone who's interested. Uh, Walter Cronkite uh, uh, did an interview of the guy who found the bullet, Tomlinson. And, um, uh, and, and Tomlinson uh, is the guy who found the bullet. He gave it to the, the head of personnel, a guy named O.P. Wright at Parkland Hospital on the day of the assassination, and they passed it along to the Secret Service agent. Now, Tomlinson and Wright later said, we, you know, the bullet did not resemble, the bullet that they were shown, 399, did not resemble the bullet that was originally found. Yet Bardwell Odom and the war FBI reported that it had. Well, it turns out there is no original reporting on that, but there is a report from Gordon Shanklin, who's the head of the FBI in Dallas. And Gordon Shanklin reported to the Washington field office, the FBI, that neither Tomlinson nor Wright could identify the bullet. That was, that was suppressed, okay? The, the one that shows up is this bogus one where Odom Wright says, oh yeah, they said that they resembled it. It, it. This is just manufactured, this is manufactured. In any case, so, so Tomlinson is interviewed uh, and, and step back for just a second. In 1967, Ting Thompson went around the Parkland Hospital and he interviewed O.P. Wright. And O.P. Wright was the personnel director. Prior to that, he'd been a sheriff's officer. He was a real guns and ammo kind of guy. He knew all about bullets. And before Tink even asked him, uh, uh, O.P. Wright said, well, you know, the bullet we found, it had a pointed bullet. He said, pointed bullet? Yeah, let me show you. And O.P. Wright reached into his drawer, pulled out a bullet with a pointed tip and he said, yeah, it looked like this. And there's a picture of it on page 174, 175 of Tink Thompson's book, Last Second in Dallas. And it was a pointed tip bullet, not a rounded tip bullet like a Malika Hargano. And and Tom and Thompson kept showing him images from the Warren Commission of what the bullets looked like. And, and he looked at it very skeptically. <laughs> and he basically saying, you know, it did not look like that. Okay. So and, and Tom in and, and in six seconds in Dallas, uh, it, uh, Thompson went through and, and found out that the bullet that was found was found on a stretcher that, that had some crumpled up clothing and a stethoscope and a, a surgical gloves um, 
uh, and that, that was where the bullet was found. And of course, that particular boat with a stethoscope and, and the uh, clothing uh, bunched up on the edge of the, of the, uh, of the thing, that, that bullet was found on that. It wasn't found on any bullets. Right. Now, here's where it gets interesting, okay? That's what he reported in 1967. So later on, when Walter Cronkite is trying to defend the Warren Commission report, he interviews Tomlinson. And Tomlin says, yeah, well, you know, we took a, a, a bullet off the, uh, uh, we took a stretcher out of the elevator and I moved it over here. And he shows an empty stretcher. But he says the bullet wasn't found on that stretcher. That was the stretcher that came down from the surgical floor where, Tom, where Connolly had been taken. That bullet was empty. He said it wasn't found on that one. It was found on this stretcher over here. And he goes over to a stretcher that's lying right next to it. And what does he have pictured on that stretcher to show what was on there? The stethoscope that Tink Thompson had originally described. <laughs> there, was well the there was a doctor here. There was a doctor here. You can't make this shit up. Okay. Now, Roger Harris also points out to something else that's important. And that Connolly, up there having had surgery, reported, as did a nurse, that a bullet came out up there on the surgical floor that was sent into evidence. Never heard anything about that bullet. Where'd that bullet go? Connolly testified to it, and the nurse at, at, at Parkland Hospital testified about that other bullet that's up, that was found upstairs on Connolly's stretcher up there. So now there's two bullets, two bullets, you know, one up in the surgical floor as well as the magic bullet. So, so again, none of this makes any sense. Uh, there's, there's, uh, and, and you know, and and there probably was some bullet found on a stretcher, which probably had nothing to do with the Kennedy assassination, a pointed tip bullet, you know, complete, but then it gets passed through. None of the first people in the bullet's chain of possession, neither Tomlinson nor Wright, nor the Secret Service Agent Johnson, nor the chief of the Secret Service, James Rowley, were shown the, the 399, the so-called magic bullet. All of them said, yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't, you know, you know, they didn't resemble the bullet that they saw that day. And then it gets passed to a guy named Elmer Lee Todd, an FBI agent, who says he wrote his initials on the on the bullet that he took in evidence before he gave it uh, to the lab at the FBI, a guy named Frazier. But there, well, were, the become, there were no initials on the bullets that you guys could that they could find. Right. And then also, well, no, no, no. There, there were initials on the bullet, but not Elmer Lee Todd's. Yeah. <laughs> he said he initialed it. He was very explicit about that. The bullet, the initials on the bullet are the initials put on the bullet by men, FBI agents in the FBI lab. And John Hunt went and was able to identify the initials written, they were inscribed onto the bullet, and he could identify the three people in the lab who said they initialed the bullet and whose initials are there. But Elmer Lee Todd said he initialed the bullet that he had, his initials are not there. So my supposition is some bullet got passed to through the chain of command up from uh, Tomlinson and Wright in Dallas to the Secret Service to Omer Lee Todd to the lab, and then that bullet disappeared in the lab. And now all of a sudden, magically, out comes a bullet that just happens to be firearms matched to Oswald's rifle. Now, well, you, I got a theory. People, I got a theory on the magic bullet. What happened was is that okay. they they found it on a stretcher, right? And it had like a, what looked like a little dent at the top of it. Some dude just walked outside, grabbed a bullet, goes, "We need a bullet." Throws it on the concrete and picks it up. And goes, "Got a bullet? Put it on the stretcher." There you go. Well, who knows? I mean, that's uh, it's a speculation. We'll never have any of us <laughs> uh, to, to to support one another. But I think that I think that you know the FBI. I mean, even you know. Things like neutron activation analysis uh, used to put a lot of people uh, behind bars on the basis of neutron activation analysis is said uh, to have matched all the bullets uh, and uh, the recovered fragments uh, to two uh, bullets that uh, to two fragments that were firearms matched to Oswald's rifle. And this was touted originally by a guy named Vincent Gwynn, uh, a, a real authority on neutron activation analysis in testimony that he gave uh, during the House Select Committee on Assassinations. And uh, Paul Hoke, for example, um, uh, was very interested in what was going on. And most people think that he sounded originally in his early years to be a critic of the Warren Commission, um, was accused by uh, J. Edgar Hoover of being a smear artist, um, but latterly became a Warren Commission defender and is now a staunch Warren Commission defender. That's Paul Hoke. Uh, but Paul Hoke 
uh, wrote a, a, an interesting in a, in, a, in a journal that he used to pass around called Echoes of Conspiracy. And he said, you know, a lot of us thought that when we got to the hospital like and assassinations, that that we would, you know, that a lot of the scientific evidence wouldn't back up the Warren Commission's conclusions, but it turns out it has, you know, that it has. And and one of the key things was the testimony given about neutron activation analysis proving beyond, uh, you know, Rosetta Strome proof that the bullets all came from two bullets fired through Oswald's rifle. Neutron activation analysis closes the case. And, and, uh, and, uh, and it turns out that Vincent Gwynn gave that testimony early on in the House Select Committee on Assassinations uh, uh, meetings. And those of us who have studied this think that that testimony really salted the mind. So people that went in there skeptical of the original conclusions thought, well, hey, now we have indisputable proof that all the fragments tested to Oswald, you know, traced to Oswald's rifle, he must have done it. And so it, it, it probably took the wind out of the sails of a lot of people who were somewhat skeptical about uh, about the original conclusions. And Vincent Gwynn went on. Now, it turns out, Vincent Gwynn was wrong. Now, how do we know that? Well, uh, Vincent Gwynn, after he testified the Warren Commission, became a favorite of the FBI. And the FBI would fly him around the country to testify on neutron activation analysis uh, results of uh, uh, in, in cases where they had bullet evidence and people were being tried for murder. And he would help put people behind bar on the basis of neutron activation analysis. And in reading about it, I happened to run across an article in the Los Angeles Times uh, in which a, 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 a true expert in, in neutron activation analysis, uh, uh, Eric Randich, uh, who worked uh, uh, for uh, uh, the Ber for in, in Berkeley for, uh, I'll think of the name of the uh, group in a minute, um, uh, it was a renowned uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. Uh, Eric Randage at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory uh, went up and testified against uh, Vincent Gwynn on a neutron activation analysis case in, uh, in uh, Alaska and basically got a guy off of a murder charge and basically debunked Gwynn. I thought, well, this is interesting. And so uh, I contacted Eric uh, uh, Randage at Lawrence Livermore Lab. And I said, look, <clears throat> here's some information uh, because Vincent Quinn has also testified that the NAA proves that only two bullets shot from Oswald's rifle uh, can be tied to the uh, to Kennedy case. Would you look at this data? So he said, well, uh, yeah, okay. He agreed to do that. And he brought a good buddy of his, a guy named Pat Grant, who, by the way, had studied under Vincent Gwynn getting his PhD at UC Irvine, University of California, Irvine, um, and knew Gwynn had no malice, bore no malice toward Gwynn, uh, but both of them decided to look at it, and I brought him in to, uh, to give a little talk in San Francisco. This is back about 2004 or five, and they both got up and gave a talk and said, you know, this doesn't make any sense. Paul Hope was sitting there. He was not happy to hear that these guys who really had deep credentials in neutron activation analysis had debunked Vincent Gwynn. They then published their work uh, in uh, Forensic Science, I think was the name of the journal, in any case, a peer-reviewed study, and uh, basically uh, debunked that entirely. Then another uh, statistician named uh, Spiegelman, uh, Cliff Spiegelman, uh, in an article that won a major award, similarly debunked neutron activation analysis. So neutron activation analysis went right out the window. Um, and since that time, other evidence that's been used to implicate Oswald has, has come under a cloud, such as the fingerprint evidence that supposedly was found on uh, uh, the rifle that's supposed to trace to Oswald. <clears throat> and many people are now wondering about the rifling characteristics that theoretically uh, firearms match the, the recovered fragments to Oswald's rifle. So none of this, it, none of this seems to be as, quote, bulletproof, as it were, uh, as has been originally argued or maintained. Uh, and every time, uh, you know, you turn over a new leaf, uh, some other, you know, uh, solid piece of evidence crumbles into ashes. Um, well, and uh, there was and, a there was a chain of custody on the bullet, but there wasn't a chain of custody on the rifle. Uh, it, it's an area I know much less about. I, I can't I can't speak definitively or authoritatively on the chain of uh, custody on the rifle. Uh, all I can say is that there is a photograph of someone in 
uh, on the day of the assassination, carrying a bullet uh, uh, through uh, uh, the school book depository. <clears throat> and most people uh, 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 believe that that is a manic or arcano that he was carrying in his arm by the appearance of the bullet in the images, uh, but, uh, the rifle rather in the images. I'm in, I'm in no speak, uh, position to speak authoritatively about that. Um, cause I, I talked to someone who did a, like a whole biography, Gary Hill, deep dive of Oswald's life. And he talked about at the uh, funeral home, they noticed that there was like black stuff on his palm and his fingertips. Like they lifted fingerprints from him. Now, I don't know if that's, yeah, no, there, that, yeah. that's been reported. I, I, I don't know the full story there, but I remember having read that, that, that apparently men went into the uh, mortuary afterward. And when they left, there was, there was, a. Uh, uh, ink on Oswald's uh, hands and fingers because <clears throat> they'd gone over there to take um, you know, fingerprints. You know, God only knows what they did with those fingerprints and where they ended up. But um, again, you know, you're dealing with uh, with an organization, the FBI, which uh, has frequently, you know, falsified information. Uh, there's a book by a guy named Terror, uh, Trevor Aronson uh, called The Terror Factory, uh, published in the last uh, three or four years. <clears throat> and uh, uh, and Trevor Aronson is, is a nationally renowned journalist. Uh, and in the Terror Factory, uh, he basically tells the, the story that, uh, that the FBI has exposed a number of terrorist plots by Muslims in the United States and has broken these up. But what he points out is that the FBI basically found some these hapless, you know, you know, uh, Muslims who, you know, really didn't have it together, were kind of shiftless and idle and, and, and failing in life. And the FBI put them up to terror plotting. They gave them the weapons. They gave them the idea. They coached them on how to do it. They gave them false bombs. It's agent And then all of a sudden, then they rushed in and arrested them for having terror plots, uh, for having uh, uh, plotting uh, uh, acts of terrorism that they themselves had designed. It's agent, agent provocateurs. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're Asian provocateurs, but Asian provocateurs go way, way back. I mean, the United States has always done that. It's always, you know, manufactured, you know, uh, uh, terror plots going, particularly during the Vietnam era, and then, and the the CIA was involved in a lot of that sort of stuff too. So, you know, we're trusting we're trusting people who who want to create <clears throat> socially constructive notions of how America works, and if they have to lie, cheat, and steal to do it, hey, no problem. <laughs> it's freaking intense man it makes you just want to like just put your hand through your hair like kramer from seinfeld like it's just it's it's ridiculous to see like i mean i get it because like i'm diving into the history part of it i'm trying to learn the backstories from oswald even talk to about tibbet's death and all these other things that fall in the line and it's just like you're trying to put this all together but none of it seems to really fit and it seems like you really have to even try harder to cover it up like just the excuses that are being made it's like if they would have just been honest with what happened and did this would we be past it by now i mean there's still documents oh no 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 no. They, they can't be honest because i think the government was very much involved in the assassination okay. elements of the government you know i mean uh you know, uh, you, well, know so you could say the people, deep state people but people argued, say conspiracy a lot of people well i mean but, uh, i mean how many how many conspiracies have already been exposed that we know about I mean, there was clearly a conspiracy to lie us into the Vietnam War. There were clearly conspiracies to, to cover it. I mean, for example, uh, um, there's a book by Nick Turst called Kill Anything That Moves. Now, everyone that has read about the Vietnam era remembers the My Lai Massacre and how 500 women and children were massacred there and uh, you know how it was exposed, and how terrible it was. And most people congratulate America for having, you know, Found that that our that some of our very bad apples had committed acts of terrorism, uh, and 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 had murdered mass murdered uh, lots of women and children innocents, uh, and so we can congratulate ourselves for having basically been honest about our own missteps. Well, in his book "Kill Anything That Moves," uh, Nick Turse, who was working on his PhD then, uh, happened to stumble upon documents that the National Archives had just put out and didn't know what was really in them. And as he filed through these reports, these were after action reports of other atrocities committed by GIs in the Vietnam era. And he went through them one by one by one, called his professors at, uh, I think it was, I think he was at Cornell uh, and said, hey, look what I found. They said, oh, very, very quietly copy every page. 
And uh, what he was going to write his dissertation about was not what he ended up writing his dissertation about. What he ended up writing his dissertation about was the fact that, uh, that there were, as he puts it in Kill Anything That Moves, there were hundreds of Lehi massacres. There was a Lehi massacre every month of one kind or another, all suppressed by our military in a conspiracy to hide the, the truth from the public. That's how the United States works. And it's no different in Afghanistan. According to the Afghanistan papers, it was exposed in the Pentagon papers. These are massive conspiracies that have gone on. You know, uh, and, 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 and for people to, to scoff, and, and the, um, there was a book by de Havilland Smith, a professor at University of Florida called Conspiracy Theory in America. And, um, uh, and de Havilland Smith uh, points out that, that uh, that the CIA put out a then secret directive uh, to their assets in the media to basically come up with the idea of uh, dismissing critics of the Warren Commission as randy conspiracy theorists, as loonies, as people who you know, didn't have the sense to trust uh, the truth that the Chief Justice of the United States had come up with, you know, that the former uh, head of the CIA had come up with about the Kennedy assassination. And, and uh, the CIA and the media <clears throat> was then exposed by the church committee and expanded upon by uh, Carl Bernstein in an essay called The CIA and the Media, that the CIA had long had its assets in American media. And we're not talking about the little guys. We're talking about the CIA worked with the heads of CBS, ABC, NBC, New York Times, Washington Post, the major outlets and would pass CIA agents, uh, uh, would, that, that these major journalistic outlets would give CIA agents journalist credentials. So there's a story of Jack Kennedy where there was a, a journalist, an American journalist arrested uh, in, in Moscow or in, in Russia someplace uh, for basically being a spy. And, uh, and, and Kennedy called over to the CIA and said, hey, is this guy a spy? He said, no, 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 he's absolutely not a spy. So Kennedy appealed to Khrushchev, who he had, you know, a reasonable relationship with, you know, much better than, than the relationships many presidents have had with the Russian leader. And he said, look, I got it from our boys that he was not a spy. So, you know, we would very much appreciate your, your, your releasing him. And so Khrushchev bowed to Kennedy's request and released him. So he released him and, he, and they flew him back to the, uh, to the United States and Kennedy invited him to the White House. He said, so, uh, so no one said, were you a spy? He goes, oh, yeah, I was. <laughs> he was fine. I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. You know, it, it's just the way it works in this country. Um, and um, uh, and you, you, the control that, the, that, that our military intelligence has on the media now, I think, is, is very thoroughgoing. I mean, if, if you read a, a lot of journalists who I trust, uh, James Risen, and the, uh, the formerly Pulitzer Prize winning former writer for the New York Times, uh, Glenn Greenwald, uh, Nick Terse, um, on and on and on, you'll find that they, uh, uh, you know, that they continually, uh, you know, basically are, you know, stepping and fetching for uh, uh, corporate, military corporate America. Uh, and, and there's nothing to be done about it. But I mean, you know, the thing that's frustrating to me, for example, does take James Risen. James Risen, Again, Pulitzer Prize winning guy, um, <clears throat> um, worked for the New York Times as a correspondent, wasn't a stringer, didn't just send them articles that they would publish. He was, a, he was employed by the New York Times for many years. Uh, and after he left the New York Times, somewhat in disgust, he tells the following two stories. He says that in the run up to the Iraq war, he and his co-author, uh, I think Eric Lickflower or someone like that, kept bringing stories to the editors of the New York Times saying that, hey, you know, Saddam Hussein probably doesn't have weapons of mass destruction, probably doesn't pose us an imminent threat. They wouldn't publish them. They would publish Judy Miller stories that said he did. In other words, they would publish the lies. They would not publish the truth. They wouldn't even give a dissenting opinion in the liberal, anti-Republican, anti-George Bush paper of record. I mean, because the New York Times has always stepped and fetched it for, uh, for us, and especially on the Kennedy case, over and over and over again. Uh, he also tells the other story that in the run-up to George W. Bush's re-election campaign, he got the story that whereas George Bush had said that we were not conducting surveillance of all Americans, we were only conducting surveillance on Americans who had 
you know, internet or phone uh, contact with people in other countries. Otherwise, people were not under domestic surveillance. Uh, James Risen got the story that, oh, no, that's not true. Everyone was under domestic surveillance in clear violation of our privacy uh, constitutional uh, uh, protections. And he brought that to the editors. They wouldn't publish that either. So here is an anti-Republican, pro-Democrat newspaper protecting the president from knowledge that the public had a right to know that, that our, you know, Demo our Republican president was spying on all of us. They wouldn't publish that. So right after the election, James Risen took a leave of absence telling his editors that he was going to be writing a book about something not related to the domestic spying scandal. But he went out to write a book on the domestic spying scandal, comes back six months later and says, OK, well, listen, fellas, uh, my book is going to is basically going to blow the whistle on the domestic spying scandal. So you guys might want to publish the New York Times where it comes out in my book. Otherwise, you're going to look kind of bad. So only then did they publish it when the gun was to their head. That's how it works in this country. I mean, we need to understand that you can't test you know, on really important issues like, you know, whether it's war, whether it's Kennedy assassination, whether it's weapons of mass destruction. Uh, you're not going to get an honest accounting in the mainstream media in this country or in other countries. I mean, I'm not singling out the United States. I mean, uh, England did pretty much the same thing uh, uh, with its press, fairly well controlled. I don't tr I don't trust the media on anything just after this pandemic and everything. But one thing that really upsets me is I'm in a lot of JFK forums and they're they're fun, but they're crazy. Um, but what really upsets me is even with the people that are divided on opinions, whether it was a lone gunman, magic bullet or anything like that. I, I when I uh, what I want to do with this panel is that I wanted to separate politics from it. And a lot of people said you can't do that. And I said, the fact of the matter is that someone died that day. JFK was killed. And we've seemed to fight over the side stuff of a magic bullet and all these types of things and really don't look at the boiled down question as to why. Now, I get that might be like a false dream aspect to get that going, but I think we have a lot of common ground if we can conversate about a lot of things about these issues, whether it's difference in opinions at all, it doesn't matter. You have to agree with those basic aspects, but the facts are facts that JFK is no longer with us. And it was after that day who killed him. There's a lot of dissenting opinions on it. I just want to have a conversation about it and get the answer out there because you have, that's the whole point of the media. In my opinion is the media stirs up animosity between people, everything from the Warren commission to all these aspects of the government to the media, they, were basically had the people saying, go in there, go invade. They killed our president, this type of aspect. Now, they were trying to say that it was Oswald, that it was Oswald was the patsy or no, Oswald was the killer. Oswald killed JFK. But if you look at what as happened part of a communist as part of a communist plot, that's the thing, and, though, it's like they're not yeah. trying to incriminate the, the Russia exactly. But they're saying like, hey, but he was a communist. And it's like, you know, everyone's going to think of one country in specific. When you say that there's going to be like they're a target towards these communist countries. At this point, they're like, government, save me. And this lets all the people's faith go into the government to handle any situation that comes up. That means if they need to go invade somewhere, if they need to start a war, the, the people are supporting you on it because they feel like they need your they you have their support basically and it this is this is seen throughout everything it happened with the pandemic it happened with so much stuff and it scares the hell out of me because i think that's where a lot of our common sense gets lost and a lot of critical thinking on things too now i'm not saying i'm the best at both of those but i'm saying if you can't ask questions and you burn the people who are just asking questions or wanting to see more evidence or more data then we're in a really topsy-turvy society no, I think that, uh, I think that, uh, pardon me, whether, no, I think, uh, um, you know, it, you know, I, I, you know, I am sort of scared of the direction this country is taking. I mean, it's been taking a, it been heading in the wrong direction, in my view, for quite a long time. And I think that the Kennedy assassination did, as was shown in the Olive Stone, in both of his Olive Stone films, um, uh, you know, did, did, the country really did pivot in a very bad direction after Kennedy died. Now, the, the country had been in, in pretty much a continuously bad direction uh, in the aftermath of World War II. I mean, it was Eisenhower who uh, approved the coup in Iran in 53 and Guatemala in 54. Uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, subsequent presidents have engineered uh, coups to install fascist dictatorships all over the world. Uh, most people don't know, for example, that there was a coup in Indonesia in 1964 and in 1965, 
that we were uh, uh, very intimately involved in supporting um, in, uh, in a brilliant book by Vincent Bevins, a Los Angeles Times reporter um, about the coup in Indonesia. <clears throat> uh, he points out the fact someone, even historians who I see as patients did not know. Uh, we helped support that coup and an Indonesian coup in 64, 65, a million people were killed. One million people were killed. Uh, coups in, in, in El Salvador, in Chile, in, we supported the military generals in Argentina. Uh, we, uh, Obama supported a coup in Honduras, put a guy named Hernandez in power, who's now sitting in jail in New York uh, for basically drug, uh, 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 for involvement in the national drug trade. Well, back when the coup first occurred, there were left-wing crazy conspiracy theorists who said Hernandez is an international drug dealer. Well, indeed he was, and he's now in jail for it. But at the time, anyone who dared suggest that because a good democratic president had, you know, had, had helped support a coup there, no one, they would say, you guys are Randy, crazy conspiracy theorists. And then of course, Trump uh, orchestrated a coup um, uh, in Bolivia uh, in 2018 was, 2019 and uh, put in a woman named Anya's, I-N-E-Z. Uh, again, the, the, the death squad started just as the death squads started under Pinochet, under the Argentine generals, under the coup in Guatemala, the coups in, you know, and, um, and, and that's what the United States has always stood for. And anyone who dares even mention that or suggest that that's the case is dismissed as a Randy conspiracy theorist. I mean, okay. You know, uh, that's just the way things work in this country. Um, and, and it's kind of frightening uh, because uh, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see anything changing. But Kennedy's situation was different. The way I, under, I think of Kennedy is that he was a spoiled rich kid, okay? But he was a spoiled rich kid who'd been in World War II. Was, if people who actually read the PT-109 book say, oh, well, that just gives a false glorification of Kennedy. Well, when people began bashing that book uh, in, in, the, in the wake of Oliver Stone's movie, one of the guys who was a Republican who Kennedy saved in a PT-109 episode came forward and said, look, I've always been a Republican, a Republican my whole life, but let me tell you, Kennedy saved us that day. He really was a hero in the PT-109 episode. But Kennedy was a spoiled rich kid. And he came into the presidency, and I think he basically said, you know, uh, his dad told him, listen, you know, you get up back off on the mafia. And he and his brother, Bobby, said, hey, screw that. You know, wait a minute, you know, we don't have to do that. We're independent. And indeed, they were. They're millionaires right from the get-go. And so I think that they became obnoxious. And so he began doing things that infuriated the establishment, okay? Uh, he comes into office, the Oval Office, and the Bay of Pigs invasion, which had been uh, planned during the waning days of the Nixon administration in 1958-59, he comes in and is presented to him as a fait accompli. It had been planned, I think, with Richard Nixon as the action officer that they were going to go in, and he, it's presented to him, and he's told, well, look, this is not America invading or attacking Cuba. This is, you know, expat uh, uh, Cubans going in to liberate their island from communist tyranny. And we just, you know, go ahead. And he, and he was pretty skeptical of the whole thing, but he reluctantly went along with it because he was the youngest man in senior levels of government, Kennedy was. And he said, all these wiser heads who, who crowed about the success of Operation Ajax, the coup in Guatemala in 54 and, and other coups that, yeah, it's gonna be just like that. We're gonna liberate the country and so on. And he went along somewhat reluctantly and all of a sudden the, the coup goes down or the, the Bay of Pigs invasion goes down. And, and it, it turns out what we now know that the CIA let slip to the Russians the day of the invasion in Cuba. So of course the Cubans knew when they were coming. So they're sitting up there on the, you know, on the, on the beaches, you know, smoking their cigars, kind of waiting for the Americans to arrive. And sure enough, in come the Americans and they're pinned down on the beaches and, uh, and high level of uh, Navy officials show up at, Ken at Kennedy's White House in the middle of the night saying, hey, look, you know, uh, things ain't going so well. We just happen to have a couple of ships offshore. We want authorization to join the coup and invade the island. And Kennedy said, no. They said, what? No, you're not. You told me it was not going to be an American invasion. We're not going to make this an American invasion. You can't do that. It infuriated the military. It infuriated them. Okay. And they were still spoiling for a fight. So in 1962, they come up with something which I'm sure you know about, Operation Northwoods. 
spoiling for a fight, they said, okay, this is what we need to do. We need to commit acts of terrorism, kill some Americans, blame it on Cuba as a pretext for war with Cuba. And, and when I first told people about this, you know, I had some very left-wing liberal people said, Gary, you know, I mean, you're pretty sensible about a lot of things, you know, but that's wacky. That's complete rubbish. I said, okay, fine. And we went online. We pulled up the, the documents signed by Lyman and Lemnitzer and all the Joint Chiefs of Staff supporting this, this Operation Northwoods. I said, here's their, their dra draft proposal signed by all these people. And there's Lyman and Lemnitzer and everybody else signing off on it. They couldn't believe it. Yeah. Well, Kennedy said no to that too. They were furious about that. And then, of course, in, later in 1962, uh, he's pushing for the nuclear, 61, 62, he's pushing for a nuclear test ban treaty. They were furious about that. They didn't want that. And then you go into uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis in, in, in October 1962, and the military wanted to bomb the island of Cuba, and Kennedy pushed he, against them. And there's a book called The Kennedy Tapes by uh, Zelikoff and May, or May and Zelikoff, Harvard University Press, in which they have the tape recordings uh, done during the, the 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And they point out in a very long afterward that is worth the price of the book, even though reading all the, the exchanges is also interesting and also uh, fal falsified to some extent by Zelikoff and May. They, they basically put an anti-Kennedy spin on a lot of it, as was later determined by the uh, archivist at the Kennedy Library who retranscribed a lot of those conversations. But in any case, even Zelikoff and May admit that during the thir thir those 13 days, and I'll close paraphrase, they say Kennedy's is the only voice in the room determined not to go to war. And, and pushed for a blockade, uh, Khrushchev blinked, the ships turned around that were carrying nuclear missiles to Cuba, it took that and it ended the Cuban Missile Crisis peacefully. Now, the after uh, uh, word on this is a pretty important one. Uh, in 1992, a group of people who were involved with the American embassy in Cuba, and including Wayne Smith, as well as a number of other people, Peter Dale Scott, and I think John Newman was there, a number of other people, met with their Cuban counterparts uh, in Barbados, I think, or the, Baham Baham the Bahamas, and they sat across the table from them, and uh, they said, well, uh, you know, what Kennedy, you know, what the military wanted to do was just send in a flotilla and bomb the island <clears throat> and bomb the missile sites that were under construction and send in our flotilla and take over the island. And the Cubans said, yeah, that's what we thought we were going to do. And then the Cubans dropped a, dropped a shoe. They said, but what were you going to do about the tactical nuclear missiles we had then in Cuba ready to go? Jaws dropped on the American side. They said, what? I said, oh, yeah, we had these tactical nuclear missiles, and I think they had a range of 250 or 300 miles or something like that. And had the United States send in a flotilla of ships to take over the island, uh, the, the Russians, like idiots, had given the Cubans authorization to fire these nukes in retaliation. Imagine the scenario. Nixon's president. He sends a flotilla of ships. The Cubans nuke the ships. The United States sees Russia's hand in this, says, uh-uh, um, and decides to nuke Russia. Russia says, this is a game two can play. They nuke us. And you and I aren't having this conversation today. Mutually Nuclear assured war. destruction. That's what would have happened. Okay. So then you move forward into the Vietnam era, into the late 1963. And Kennedy was telling a lot of people, including people that would come to him proposing, he, he sent in combat troops to Lambo, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. And he continually refused. He kept escalating the number of, quote, advisors, some of whom were involved in military action, no doubt about that, but pushed against the military. He pushed continually against the military, uh, and he only sent in advisors out of desperation to, to, to deal with the pressure he was under by the military to expand the war there. So, and, but he, he made people clear, and he would tell people, and this is quoted in several places, he said, look, <clears throat> McNamara, General McNamara says that if you commit the force of the United States to a land war in Asia, you ought to have your head examined. If you can convince McNamara, maybe you can convince me. But privately, he was letting everyone know that he was not going to go to war in Vietnam. So he pissed him off at the Bay of Pigs. He pissed him off with the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. He pissed him off with, by refusing to authorize the North uh, Woods uh, uh, plot. Uh, again, a conspiracy. Uh, he he uh, pissed them off during the uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, he was, he, he, and he was going to piss them off in Vietnam. Well, okay, that was the coup de grace. That was why he had to be gotten rid of. They were going to have their Vietnam War. 
Ed Kennedy was not going to be, we're not going to stand in the way. They're going to let him stand in the way. He'd already stood in the way, in the way of too many other things. And when he gave his American University speech uh, uh, a couple of few months before he was assassinated, he made it very clear that he wanted a piece that was not necessarily a Pax Americana, basically one enforced by the United States. And he had worked behind the scenes to support you know, uh, liberation movements in, in some other countries. He, he was not a clanking cold warrior as he's been depicted by Warren Commission loyalists such as Max Holland and others. He was somebody who really did depart from what had been the direction the United States had been going in ever since World War II during the Cold War, a militaristic, hostile, uh, pro-fascist, pro-military uh, 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 direction. Uh, Kennedy stood athwart that, and he was eliminated. I need to get you and Peter Kuznick on the same episode. That would be great. You guys have so much back history about like the Vietnam War and stuff like that. Well, Kuznick, Kuznick's the guy. I mean, you know, Kuznick and John Newman, uh, you know, those are the guys that can lay this out in detail. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people have argued that, well, you know, Kennedy was against the Vietnam War, but it was pretty clear that he only, you know, opposed it because he thought we were winning and he was willing to withdraw because he thought we were winning. And John Newman and others, but particularly John Newman has shown, oh, no, 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 no. Kennedy knew we weren't winning. Kennedy knew that we stood no chance of winning, and yet he stood, he still uh, was determined not to go to war because he knew what would happen. Uh, he talked to de Gaulle. He went to Vietnam in 1954, and our American ambassador there, when the French were fighting the war, and we were quietly funding the French war, by the way, which Kuznick could probably detail for you in ways I can't. Uh, we were funding the French in that war. I think we paid something like 80 or 90 percent of, of the cost for the French to continue fighting in Vietnam. Um, but he went in 54. Kennedy went to Vietnam, spoke to the American ambassador. And the American ambassador told him, he says, look, there's no way the French are ever going to win this war. Are you kidding? I mean, you can't tell, you know, a friend from foe in this country and they're fighting for their own country. The French are going to be bled to death here. And he took that lesson very hard. He talked to de Gaulle. De Gaulle told him, no way are you going to win that war. You're just not going to win that war. And de Gaulle basically, you know, had, had the experience of the Vietnam War himself. And so he went into this with lots of personal as well as historical background, knowing that if the United States went in there, we would go the same way the French uh, went, which is exactly what happened. We went in there just as happened in Afghanistan. We went in there and, you know, the most powerful military force in the United States was basically vanquished by, <clears throat> you know, a bunch of uh, Muslims you know, waving rifles. <laughs> because they're fighting for their own country and they can wait you out. They can set up in, in, in hidden little enclaves. You never know who the enemy is. You never know where they're coming from. And they don't mind dying for their own country, just as America, Americans would die for our own country, you know, where the Canadians to invade or the Mexicans to invade or the Russians to invade. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, it's just the way the world works. And, and, and Kennedy was not, was going to change the direction. Um, and was changing the direction on other issues such as civil rights and civil liberties and that sort of thing. The United States has always been you know, opposed to that and particularly right wing elements in this country. And, I, and by the way, I grew up in the right wing of the Republican Party. I don't have any, you know, uh, you know, original you know, animosity toward them. Or, or, you know, uh, my parents ran John Birch Society chapters out of our home when I was growing up. You know, I. I, I thought I was libertarian, but I'm at this point politically homeless. I just don't have the time or the energy. I know people always say like, oh, you got to do something. It's like there are real like things that I can do, which is like I had a guest on about the Judge Rodenberg Center, which closed down in 2021, where they were shocking developmentally disabled people like not, like not like electroconvulsive therapy, but worse, like way worse than a cattle prod and a shock collar. This closed down during like when COVID at peak COVID when that came out. And a kid got shocked 79 to 100 something times. And he had severe third degree burns on the side of his head and acute stress disorder. And there are hundreds of these stories. They would tie him to four point boards and shock him. And you know what you get if you get shocked once, there's a rule for getting shocked again. And that's just by moaning or flinching if you get shocked. Where I'm like, I would get shocked. So it's like that's real things that are still happening today all over the all over the United States that you can't do. And it works in your community. But like when it comes to elections and stuff, 
to me, that's a lost cause. Like I always look at like, there's a bigger thing running there than the president. I think he's just a face and people don't th- think of what you think Illuminati. I'm like, is it just Illuminati or is it big businesses that somehow worked its way in? I think that there was a book um, uh, called Predator State uh, written by James Galbraith, the son of John Kenneth Galbraith. Predator State was published in 2008 by John Kenneth, or by James Galbraith. And he makes the argument there that I think uh, has been expanded upon by other people, including uh, a guy named uh, Peter Goodwin uh, in a book uh, called Davos Man, D-A-V-O-S. That's, they have the World Economic Forum meets in Davos every year. In fact, it just met recently. Uh, but uh, John Ken- or, uh, James Galbraith in Predator State uh, makes the, the point that what's happened in America is that the government has essentially been taken over by powerful economic forces in this country, private economic forces both corporate and those uh, of very, very wealthy individuals. And basically our lobbyists, their lobbyists rather, not ours, their lobbyists write the laws. And the laws are often written word for word by lobbyists for powerful corporations, wealthy individuals. They basically control the government and use the power of the government to fleece the middle class and the poor for the benefit of a very tiny elite. And I don't say that as someone who's poor, who's struggling against, you know, uh, a, a difficult financial uh, time in life. I've done very well, thank you very much, having grown up in a family of 12 with a dad that was often out of work, having worked for my first job at the age of eight. You know, I've worked my way through grammar school, high school, and college, you know. I never had any money, and I've done beautifully in life. It's not like I hate America because it's been bad to me economically. It's been wonderful to me economically. But that ain't what's happening in America anymore. Uh, your chances of rising to prosperity from poverty in America are worse in America than they are in any other first world country for reasons that are obvious. I went through with no family money, four years college, four years of medical school, and I owed when I was done $2,400. Today, people going through that same program end up owing, and I teach young physicians, by the way, I teach residents, fellows. Uh, These are all people who graduated from medical school. And a lot of these guys tell me, even those with family money are coming out owing $200,000, $250,000, and some without that are owing as much as $500,000, $600,000. College students coming out of private colleges or, and even out of public colleges are in hock from anywhere from thirty dollars to $120,000. What other country does that? None. It, it, the odds are stacked against people that don't have money in this country. And, and, and Davos Man, which is a book I'd recommend to ev- anyone, Peter Goodman, and he... He writes for the Financial Times of London, and he's the economics or the financial correspondent for the New York Times. This is not someone who hates you know, wealth and money, but he basically tells the tale about how how basically big money hides its assets in offshore accounts um, and refuses to pay taxes to support the societies that educate the people that work for them. Pandora Papers. Uh, it, it, it's a scandal. Um, I think the name of the book is The Finance Curse. You've been given uh, a lot of promotions to other people's books. You better be promoting some of your own. We've only been uh, talking well, I, two know, hours. I've written a lot of stuff. They can, they can look what I've written about the Kennedy case. But, 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 you know, but this gets to the bigger picture that we're seeing that has, that has emanated from the events that followed Kennedy's assassination. And that is that uh, our military corporate overlords basically run the show in this country. And they will continue to expand wars. Uh, they will continue to uh, send money to the upper reaches. And, 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 and people have no clue. For example, you ask people, okay, well, so we all heard about tax havens, okay? Uh, where do you think the two largest tax havens in the world are? And they'll say, oh, well, what, the Seychelles Islands or the Bahamas, or they'll come up with all these obscure places. The two largest tra- uh, tax havens in the world, according to the, the New York, uh, the, the uh, uh, London Times, financial correspondent who also writes for Financial Times of London <clears throat> are New York and London. That's where the tax havens are. Now, if you're an American, you can't hide your, your money in New York tax haven. You go to London to hide it. And if you're in London, you can't, uh, if you're British, you can't uh, uh, hide your, uh, your, your, your swag in, in London. You, you come to New York. Uh, but that's how it works. And, 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 they, they, and these over, our financial overlords basically are impoverishing the entire population of this country and supporting endless wars and endless mass murder. Uh, you know, it's very frightening to me, you know, as, as someone who grew up in the right wing of the Republican Party. I'm just old enough that when I was a teenager, 
I campaigned on the Goldwater. I, 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 I worked with Robert Munger, who was the California uh, campaign chairman for the Goldwater for President uh, campaign. Um, and, and, and I remember the quip that we used to tell after landslide uh, uh, Lyndon had, uh, had uh, beat Goldwater in 1964. <clears throat> and the quip was, well, you know, people told me that if I voted for Goldwater, I would have a land war in Vietnam. And you know what? They were right. <laughs> I voted for Goldwater, and sure enough, there was a war in Vietnam. <laughs> um, uh, all, all I want is a Wikipedia page. I'm not picky. I just want, I just want a Wikipedia page. <laughs> well, yeah, we're, uh, you know, I think we're in, a, we're in a dark place. I think Kennedy did represent change, real fundamental change in this country. Uh, I think because he did so, he was removed. Uh, I think that the, the the history of America ever since then has been one of uh, of showing, proving how um, the change that Kennedy would have wrought uh, would have taken to a, us to a very different place than we are now. Uh, had the had he had he lived to uh, uh, to execute those changes that that he was moving in the direction of, he was moving in the direction against war, uh, uh, against uh, our imperial adventures around the world. Uh, against our colonial policies uh, all around the world. Uh, these are things which I think would have not only uh, benefited uh, us as Americans, it would, they would have been a huge benefit to the rest of the world, particularly the developed world or the undeveloped, or the developing world. Gary, you've given me enough of your time, man. Is there a place where people can find any of your links? Um, or oh, just Google up Gary Aguilar, JFK assassination. You'll find there's a lot of stuff that I've written on Jim, Jim DiEugenio's website. Um, Kennedy and Kings. <clears throat> You know, because there's um, shout out to Jim. I love Jim. Jim's awesome. No, Jim Jim, Jim Giudino has done heroic work on this subject, and and uh, you know he's got a phenomenal memory. He remembers all sorts of stuff. He remembers stuff that I've said that I forgot I said. You know, like 25 years ago. Uh, so he, he's he's a tremendous asset. And I I do occasionally have uh, small little salons here in the Bay Area. I used to have them at, at a nice hospital, and people would fly in from all over the country, and they'd be. These would be, you know, very private salons. These are the ones where Randich and Grant first debunked the neutron aggregation analysis before they put it in print in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. And, and by the way, <clears throat> the people who defend the war, I mean, this, this shows you how it works, okay? Just take neutron activation analysis, which has been completely debunked as proving that all the bullets and bullet fragments came to, to fragments traced to Oswald's rifle. Okay, totally debunked, okay? Yet you have a guy named Lucian Haig, uh, and Larry Sturdivant, uh, who wrote really silly articles in some, quote, journal uh, that have since been roundly debunked. So Nicholas Nally, who now defends jet effect theory, who came up with a ridiculous supposition that Kennedy's brain weighed 2,100 grams when he was hit in the head, and then later had to retract that and said, well, uh, maybe it didn't weigh uh, 2,100 grams. It may have weighed only 1,850 grams or 1,600 grams or maybe even 1,500 grams. Where did people come up with this sort of idiocy? Um, he got a dartboard yeah, in your I mean, toss. Them. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, where, where do they come up with this? Idiot? Human brains don't weigh 1,800 grams or even 1,600 grams. And they, and okay, is he proposing that the 1,500 gram, which is his third supposition, that Kennedy's brain weighed 1,500 grams at autopsy, which is the same it weighed before he was hit in the head and all this brain material is blown all over the place? Okay, but Ken, but Nick Nally, who comes up with these this crazy stuff, basically says, well, you know, uh, there has been a debate about a neutron activation analysis, but you know, uh, uh, the people who are defending NAA, Vincent Gwynn, and uh, of course, and more recently, uh, uh, Ken Ron and Larry Sturdivant, these are people who cannot be dismissed, and so you know, we really, you know, you really can't judge between them. Randage and Grant have true legitimate, first of all, Randish and Grant are conspiracy agnostics. They don't care one way or another. All they'll tell you is that NAA, uh, that Gwyn's NAA doesn't work, okay? Rant, you know, Ken Ron and Larry Sturdivant have been ardent anti-conspiracists and have no background in NAA as compared with the deep, deep background of guys who work for the government, Lawrence Livermore Lab, Randish and Grant have deep background in that. And Nick Nally, is very defensive of Larry Sturdivant, and he will defend anything that he says, or at least will not criticize anything he says. And he holds that Larry Sturdivant, who has no credentials in this, <clears throat> as, as an equivalent source on the question of NAA, as people with deeply credentialed 
uh, uh, backgrounds who are conspiracy agnostics. That's how it works. That's exactly how it works. Um, uh, I'm going to link all your links and Jim's links as well, too, when it comes to the Kennedys and King's website into the description. We almost talked for two hours. That, I wish we did talk for two hours. That was awesome. That, well, thank you very much. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, please send me a link uh, to your website and because there are a couple other things I want to check out on there, if you will. And it just send it to me via email. And um, and so that I can <clears throat> get up there because a couple of things that you mentioned that I think are on your website that I'd like to I'd like to check out.